In this video, we're going to be taking a look at a method of automatically identifying support and resistance lines on a candlestick chart using Python. This can be a super helpful tool for filtering your exits and entries on a given trade. If you know that they're just about to head towards a line of resistance, you might think about cutting your exit early and vice versa for entries. And even if you don't use technical analysis, the method behind the construction of the algorithm will be useful to you in your algorithmic trading journey anyway. So if we look at an example of what the algorithm produces, we have this nice chart here. So you can see it does a decent job. This is using 50 candles, and I believe this is one minute data for Bitcoin. So it picked up this line, this line, and this line. Were I to do this manually, I would probably put one here. So it missed that off, but we're not expecting absolute perfection out of this thing. So how does it actually work? Let's go ahead and dive into the details here. So we'll go right to the top here and we'll start off by just loading our data. So this is very simple. We've got a pandas CSV here. We're loading in the open, high, low, close columns, and we're giving them names, and we're converting our index here to date time. So super simple, basic stuff. And we're also going to just import some basic libraries like pandas and plotly and numpy. Okay, so we've done that, and we've loaded in our data. Next thing we're going to do is we're just going to take a sample of that data. So I had a month's worth of minutely data there. Now you're not going to want to plot the whole thing and plot out every single resistance point, although I guess you could if you wanted to, but that might be a little bit overwhelming. So I've just taken a slice here of 50 bars. So from the hundredth bar to the 150th bar, I've created a slice and then I just slice into our data using that value. I'm then generating three different versions of our data here. So we've got the data as a data frame object. We've got all of the closing values as a numpy array. So just the closing values. And then we've got a copy of those closing values, which I'm going to hang on to for later on. So if we just plot our closing values here, we get a graph that looks like this. We're using a line graph here rather than a candlestick chart as a line is going to be easier to analyze as you're dealing with less data. But as a result, the model is going to be less accurate when we plot that back onto candlesticks. So if we move on a bit here, what we're going to do in this approach is we're going to find all of the minima and maxima on this graph. Now, being a one minute chart, it's pretty volatile. And so we're going to end up with a big list of those extrema. So if we go down here, you can see I'm importing this function from scipy.signal, and that's going to help us find all of the maxima and minima on this graph. So a maxima is going to be a pointy bit like that, and the minima is going to be the converse. So basically all of the turning points of this graph. The reason we care about turning points is that's when a stock is likely to have hit a point of resistance or a point of support. Those are the times when the graph is going to be turning a lot. So that's why we've done that there. You could smooth this graph out a little bit if you wanted to, and that would help get rid of the, some of the noise, but I chose not to do that here. So we'll go over here and I'm grabbing the maxima and the minima and then combining those into one big number array. So I'll print those out here just so that we can see what's going on. So extrema, print that out. Basically just a bunch of indices within our closing values here. So we had 50 values in our original slice of candlesticks because we took a slice of 50 and we've ended up with this array here and we'll see how many elements are in the array. There are 26 elements in the array. So like I said, you could add some smoothing if you thought that was too many turning points, but I think the graph works quite well as it is. So I'm going to leave it as it is for now. 
What I'm then going to do is I'm just going to visualize these turning points so that you can see what's going on here. So this is just a, a basic matplotlib plot here. So I'll press go and every line here represents one of these maxima or minima. And the x-axis represents the price at which that occurred. So you can see it goes from 23K to 23.2. And each line represents the point at which this graph turns. So it has a spike up or it has a spike at the bottom here. So a peak or a trough. Each one of these lines on this graph represents that. Now, my idea is with this algorithm that the points of resistance or support on a graph are going to be when you find lots of these points clustered together. So there's no time dimension on this data. It's literally just the price at which it occurs. It doesn't matter in which order it happened. We just care about the price at the turning points. And if we see a big bunch of them all together, that's a strong indication that that point is a turning point. Now, I tried lots of clustering algorithms like k-means clustering and a few other variants that I found in the sklearn documentation. But ultimately, none of those really did the job I wanted. What we need to do is we need to take this and extract some signal for it. If you wanted to, you could just plot out here the exact values of these prices and use that as your lines of support and resistance. So maybe I'll just do that here just to show you what that would look like. So if we do plt.plot, we'll plot the sample df.index against sample df.close. So we'll just end up with a line chart here. And then we'll plot our prices on top of that. So you could do 4x in extrema prices over here. And then, you know, plt.h lines. We use the value of x. And then I think that might work. Yeah, we need an x min and an x max. So x min is equal to sample df.index zero and we'll just do the same thing over here with the maximum so you can do that if you want to uh, but it ends with uh, quite a mess here like this is this is not really something that we can easily and readily use to trade on it might be useful as an indicator looking where historical turning points have happened but we really need to filter this data a little bit and extract some more meaningful data points from it. It's not too useful just looking at the turning points here is the point I'm trying to get across. So I've talked enough about the problem. How are we going to solve it? Well, I ended up using a kernel density estimation, which if you've never heard of, neither had I until I started this project. And basically how it works is that we give it some data points. So I'm going to give it these values here. So these numerical values, so the prices at which the turning points occur. And then we assume that those data points were generated by some random function. So we assume that we had a random function and we took out however many samples there were here, 26. And this is the distribution that we got. How could we from the data go back and estimate what our original probability density function looked like. Well, there's a very helpful function in scikit-learn called kernel density. And this is basically what it does. I'll just run it here. So it takes all of those data points in and tries to imagine what our original probability density function might have looked like. Now, the bandwidth parameter here is very important. I'm going to make it a bit smaller here because it seems to be too large here. So you can see this is like an example of what that might look like. So if you've never seen a PDF before, basically the higher the value here, the more likely it is to be drawn. So the number on the x-axis is the price and the number on the y-axis is how likely that is to occur in this random function. 
that we're imagining here that simulated the original prices. And the smaller the value of the bandwidth here that you use, the more spiky this graph is going to become. So I'll crank this up a decent amount and you'll see what I mean. It becomes very, very spiky and peaky at that point. But if I reduce it by quite a lot, then it basically just looks like a slanted normal distribution here. So this particular bandwidth value is very, very important for us. But essentially what this function has done is it's taken our very, very spiky and all over the place data here and it's combined it all in such a way that it's more easy to find a signal here. So if I move that, we can then use these maxima here as our points of resistance and of support because these are the values that are most likely to occur by this fake random process which we've thought up. So just again, I'll quickly cover how our thinking is working here. So we drew a simple line graph of the prices of the asset. The graph is very spiky and the spiky points are the points at which the price sharply turned. And so we think that those points are much more likely than other random points to be points of resistance or of support. So we extract all of these spiky points and we put them in a nice list. If we plot out the values of the spiky points on the horizontal axis, we forget about time. They sort of bunch together in certain areas, but we need a systematic method of figuring out where the optimal middle point is of these different bunches and which ones are just noise, whereas which ones are actually telling us something that there is actually a line of resistance or support there. And the method that I chose to do that is kernel density estimation, which, like I said before, we assume that these points were generated by a random process and we attempt to figure out what the probability density function looks like for that function. And depending on the value of the bandwidth that you select here, you'll get varying plots with different amounts of spikiness. The important thing though is that it's way, way smoother than the graph we had before. And so what we can do is we can find the maxima of this graph and use those to represent our lines of resistance and support. So all this function does here is it just finds the peaks of this probability density function. And then when we plot those out, we get this nice candlestick chart. We can add some error bars about that. So let me just put those in here. So I think it's region equals 0.001, let's say. 0.001. See what that looks like. There you go. So if we add some error bars around the lines of resistance and support here, they do look reasonable, to me at least, for a relatively simple and easy to implement algorithm. We can also look at the line graph here. That could be a little bit more instructive since the data is actually derived from the line graph and not from the candlestick chart. As you can see, that also does a reasonable job, although it does miss this one out at the bottom, as we discussed before. So this is great. This is the methodology that we're using, but there are a few problems with it. The main one being that it's very, very dependent on what this bandwidth parameter is here. So if I reduce this bandwidth parameter a lot, we just get one single peak there. If I then plot that out, I mean, this is actually a decent line here for support and resistance, but we maybe want something a bit more detailed. We want more than one line. We want to draw, say, the best three lines that it can come up with. And to do that, we're going to have to come up with some methodology of automatically picking the bandwidth number. So if we scroll down a little bit here, I basically copied and pasted all of the above cells into this function here, and we take in a slice of data. So in, our, in my case, 50 bars of data. We specify the number of peaks that we want in our PDF. So this is gonna be the number of lines of resistance that it draws. 
I want that to be between two and four. And then we also select a interval parameter here. So this is gonna be the initial value of bandwidth. How I do it is I start with a really small value. So one ten thousandth times the price of the asset and then slowly increase that until it generates our particular amount of support lines that we're actually after. The rest of the code's exactly the same here. It just loops through lots of different bandwidths until it finds the right one. So let's go see what that looks like. So it generates this one and this one, which we've seen before. Let's change the slice here. So we'll grab the hundredth to the 150th bar, see what this looks like. Does a reasonable job here of finding a line of support here, here, and here. Now, if you wanted to use this for yourself, there is a little bit of tweaking you have to do depending on what kind of asset you're trading, what the regular price range is for that asset, what the time frame is, and that kind of thing. You can adjust some of these hard-coded values I've used here to more accurately reflect the data that you're using. And so it'll come up with better lines of resistance for your particular asset, and that'll be more helpful. One of my main goals with this project was to try and make it as fully automated as possible so that the machine would do all of the work and we don't have to program in really strict rules about exactly what does and what does not comprise a area of support or resistance because after all, technical analysis is much more of an art than a science. And I want the computer to pick up on patterns that us feeble humans might not recognize otherwise. So let me know if you enjoyed this peek into one of the projects I've been working on recently. And if you've got any ideas for improving it or other techniques that I should pursue. Maybe I'll do a V2 of this video using your networks or something similar. And so I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you in the next one.